Hello everyone and welcome to Real Game Talk, a podcast where me, your host Daniel Lima, receive different guests to have a real talk about video games and the video game industry. We have a great show planned for you today. We're going to talk about video game reboots, video game adaptations, shoot TV, movies, and also a little bit about Nintendo and their plans for E3, besides maybe a few surprises or random topics here and there. So today I'm joined by one of my good friends who has been uh, able to show up to all episodes of Real Game Talk so far, Roberto Rubiano. Hello everyone. What's up, Roberto? What's up? And also a very special guest today. He is the host of a show called Musing with Menchaca, which I appreciate a lot. Louis Menchaca. How's it going, buddy? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing great, too. Um, All right. Cool. So let's get this started. Louis, we've talked a few times before, but I don't think uh, like I, we've ever got too much into like what kinds of like games do you like. And I just kind of wanted to get a better idea of your background. Like, what are your, some of your favorite games? Um, which consoles did you want? What was your first console? That kind of stuff. So just like if you could kind of get started on that so that we can get started on the conversation and just uh, see a little, know a little bit more about yourself. Uh, well, the first console that I've ever actually owned that was exclusively mine was the the original PlayStation, the PS1. Nice. Or as some, some people call it, the PSX, which I never understood that. Yeah, I actually don't have no idea where that came from too, but I've seen some people say that. <laughs> And so, uh, but really though, I'm I'm really more of a Nintendo guy. Uh, my first handheld was the original Game Boy, like the original monochrome gray brick uh, Game Boy. <laughs> Just playing Pokemon Red Blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I was I was rocking at that time the Game Boy Pocket. Oh uh, shit! Yeah, I, I never wanted one of those. Nice. But. Uh, but really, the 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 real thing about me when it comes to games is I'm I'm pretty much of a multi-platform type of person. I like to play different kinds of games, but I really like to stick to like Nintendo. They just Nintendo. Uh, I I feel like it's its own genre of games, and I just right. really enjoy them those games the most. I feel like they make some of the best games, dude. And like we've had a lot of people that like Nintendo coming to the podcast before, so I, I kind of want to make sure we don't uh, get too much just talking about Nintendo so that way they don't think we're all fanboys or something. But man, like they Nintendo kind of like they have a, a standard for games, you know, the net, it never gets below that point where like even a bad Nintendo game usually is still a good game for like general standards. So I don't know. I just think like their level of attention to detail and general quality in the products is really good. And I'm still like up to this day, a big fan of Nintendo as well. My first yeah. console was the Super Nintendo too. Uh, well, not cheap, but so that's, that's part of the reason as well. Yeah. The, the, the seal of quality, it really, it really, uh, they don't just, it's not a sticker that they put on the games that means nothing. I mean, Nintendo yeah. is really good for QA and games all the time. And like, I think I can only think of one game that Nintendo shipped and it had a, had a glitch in it, a, a game breaking glitch. And that was uh, Metroid Other M. But when you think about the whole entire library of all Nintendo published games and you got one game that you can say yeah. that about. I, yeah. remember, I remember there was one thing with Skyward Sword as well, where they released like a full update. You know, they released a Wii channel where like you could install the channel and then it would like if you run the channel, it would fix your game in case it got stuck in that certain point. So it was kind of like this very weird uh, thing, but it wasn't something everybody got. It was like something very uncommon. Uh, but I remember kind of reading a little bit about that back then. But hmm. Well, since you really like Nintendo and we kind of started talking about Nintendo, I'm going to bring up one of my topics here, which is... You know, this year, uh, we got a lot of new companies doing press conferences at E3, which is right around the corner. We're so excited. It's, it's right about there. So Bethesda is having a press conference this year. Guess what they're going to announce? Probably follow up for or something. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Microsoft has a conference as usual. Sony, Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, Square Enix. They are going to have press conferences, but Nintendo has announced that for the third consecutive year, they will be hosting their own Nintendo digital event thing. Um, is it is it the third consecutive year? I thought this was only the second. It was the third because like okay, so wait, last year I thought, la I thought last year was the first and first ever Nintendo di digital event. Okay, I just got this from like a piece of news that I read that said third, but let me think this a little bit. Last year we had the one with uh, Robot Chicken where they right. had like that animation yes. thing, but then the year before didn't they just do like a basic uh, Nintendo Direct where Iwata showed up like holding a banana and he was talking about tropical freeze and that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, you that's know right. What? You're right. Yeah, yeah. They wasn't. It wasn't called a digital event. It was just a Nintendo Direct. Is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. to, to, uh, yeah, but you have a good point. Just to clarify. Like there was that one Nintendo Direct thing, and then I think they renamed it to Nintendo Digital Event just because people looked at that with very like bad eyes at that time. They were really like, "Oh shit, Nintendo is out of E3." When that was not really the case. They still had like games being showcased there and everything. They just chose to do their own uh, digital uh, event or direct to to talk about them rather than, than being on stage. But 
here's the thing. I remember when they made that decision for the first time, a lot of people were against it and were and were like complaining that that wasn't the right way to go. And eventually everybody kind of accepted it, I think. And we're at the point where they announce it and everybody goes, okay, that's expected um, of them at this point. And, and nobody really gets surprised. But I want to say that I, I am still like a little disappointed about that. And not just say that their directs are bad. I feel like I understand why they do it and why it's it's like... It's cheap and it gets the information in a more precise way that they can control without having like issues. But when I remember that A3 from like, I think it was 2011, where they started with a whole orchestra playing like a Zelda medley and they were showing like scenes from the games in the backgrounds, like right by the, by the projector. When I remember the way I felt back then, like I miss that feeling so much, you know, like I miss Nintendo coming out there and being like, we're going to rock with this awesome presentation that everyone is going to be jealous about. So I don't know. This is still like a little bitter switch for me that they're not doing that kind of stuff anymore. How do you guys feel about it? So, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess it caught everyone off guard a little bit, but personally, I think it, I think it works. I don't know if they're like E3 has rules or whatever, but I feel like Nintendo could definitely do more with uh, their own stuff. And clearly they've proven that already. They partnered up with like uh, Robot Chicken last year, so who knows what they could actually pull off this year. Right. Yeah. Personally, Plus, I, I was going to say, personally, I actually do love it. Um, I think that for me, uh, just if I were to say uh, which company won E3 last year, I'd say it was Nintendo. Uh, I feel like having a well put together, uh, edited, uh, you know, presentation is pretty much way more effective than having a live audience to deal with because you're having you have way more uh you have way more of a, a balancing act to, to deal with when you're dealing with uh, a live uh, audience that you have to like you know feed energy off of and stuff like that if the room isn't feeling it then that's going to kill your whole vibe yeah you know what yeah that, that that is definitely a good point and i totally understand why they're probably thinking that way because they've run into problems before i remember there was this 183 where they were showcasing um skyward sword which might have been the same one, same one that i was talking about before and miyamoto came on stage and he was trying to demonstrate the motion controls but probably because of the way they had it set up and everything at that point like they weren't really working that well so he kept being there like oh if you swing this way the sword is gonna swing this way and the sword like wasn't really going exactly as he was doing it so i remember that was kind of embarrassing a lot of like some people mentioned that back then but well, I was gonna say a, a better a better example was whenever they they uh, debuted Wii Music and then they were all playing their like little fake instruments with the Wii rem with the Wii remotes. Oh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> that was like a really awkward, very like the worst moment you can possibly <laughs> Nintendo probably ever did at, at an E3 stage. So it's thing it's things like that they want to avoid. Right. I remember that there's even like a scene from that that became a meme. The like the people keep seeing the internet in the internet all the time, like them just like playing drums or something. <sighs> yeah. But I don't know, man. I still feel like the good moments compensated the like the bad moments for the most part. Like there was that one time, like as well, when they I think they had just the, the, the 3DS had just released, and if you guys remember correctly, the 3DS when when it just released. Um, it kind of like it had some decent sales in the beginning, but then it kind of spiked down, went down because because people weren't really that interested anymore, and there wasn't really a lot of games coming out. And then they had like this E3 presentation where like they they put on the projector like five. I remember th there were five games, and I think they were Mario Kart Seven, Super Mario 3D Land, Luigi's Mansion, Dark Moon, and oh shit, what were the other two? Uh, Star Fox 64. And the fifth one was probably Occurring of Time or something. And just the way they were, like, showing those games back to back. And, like, everybody reacting. And, like, when Luigi came up and everybody was like, holy shit. Like, nobody expected them to come back with Luigi's Mansion at that point. Um, I just feel like the crowd reaction adds to, to the emotion of that moment. And I also feel like, yeah, you may look and, and say that Nintendo won E3 last year. It kind of failed the same way just because it was the... The presentation that showed the most games that I was interested on, but I don't feel like it, it has really helped them that much as far as uh, spiking their sales go. You know, they're still like struggling a lot with getting more Wii U units and even 3DS units before releasing the new one uh, to the consumers. So I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if like going back to the traditional style and just making like a badass presentation couldn't help them in some way at that point, at this point. But 
e well, another sua. thing another Co thing to consider about Nintendo is I mean because of those the the fact that you mentioned that their their sales their sales numbers for hardware has gone down I mean the 3ds is not the DS and the Wii U is not the Wii right uh, so the fact of the matter is when it comes to you know doing these uh, these presentations they they do cost a lot of money to rent those uh, those big auditorium I'd say if anything it's way more cost efficient to to do that and probably makes more sense I mean if if the, if they were if they were selling you know those uh, gangbuster you know doorbuster units kind of thing numbers and things like that I'd say yeah go for it they should totally be like uh, you know being flaunty the way uh, Sony is with their with their press conference but if anything since there I would say Nintendo is a hungry Nintendo right now and in, and because of that it's forcing them to think outside the box and they're and I think uh, having that unconventional that hungry Nintendo it's gonna it only basically, uh, you know, breeds more excellence as I would, as the best way I could describe it. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it, I have to admit. Like, same way that, like, usually competition brings the quality up. Just them, like, having to, to struggle a little more to, to get their products out there and to get people to buy their products. That that will make them be way more creative than they normally are. And granted, like, I will give them that the Robot Chicken presentation last year, it was hilarious. And I never expected anything like that to come out from Nintendo. So that was really cool. And I'm just quite curious to see what's going to go on this year. I honestly I hope mean, they don't do Robot Chicken this year, though. I want them to do something else. Like, I can't, you can't, <laughs> they can't do, they can't, they can't do the same <laughs> trick. Okay. Right. Well, they're bringing back the World Championships this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Actually, do you know more about that, Roberto? Because like, I, I I don't even know. Like, I so, heard about their old championships, but I don't even know what they're doing now or whatever. Go ahead. All I remember is that way back in the '90s, they would I guess hold like physical competitions and gaming competitions, and at the end, the winner would get like a super ultra rare cartridge for the NES. Right. Like, so I'm I'm one. I'm curious to see what challenges they're going to present. Two, I want to see what ultra rare prize. I wouldn't be surprised if it's like a unique amiibo or something. Man, that could be cool. Well, yeah. um, I already know. It's already been announced what, oh, what the world championship is. Well, first off, going back to the original one, the original one was when it was during the NES era. And so what they were doing is they were playing uh, this, uh, the Nintendo World Champions. Uh, it's, it's the game that's on the cart that was made specifically for that. And I think it's like a, what I think it is, is I'm not 100% sure on this, but I'm, I'm pretty confident is what it is. It's like a vertical slices of specific games, like a little bit of a, a Mario levels and a little bit of, uh, of something else, another, like two other games. And so what it is, is you have to uh, play that game within a certain time frame. And then you uh, have to score the highest score. So the world champion is the person who gets the highest score. And so for this one, is they're going back to the NES days because they have a, a game on the Wii U and the 3DS, NES Remix. So they're going to, the, the championship is going to be uh, playing NES Remix, which is basically the, the perfect thing because when the Nintendo World Champion was basically a little vertical slices of NES games. NES Remix is the exact same thing, and you have a score behind it too. So you have timed, you have the, the rating stars, and you have everything. And I think they're doing the three, 3DS edition of it. And it's basically uh, you, you go to a Best Buy that you know at one of those locations to try to enter. The best of the best go to actually go to Las Vegas to compete there on stage. Man, that's awesome. I, I wonder if they're going to do like all the, the weird things from NES Remix as well. Then like are, like, are they only going to do the ones that are simple challenges using the the original game mechanics? Or if they're going to do the, the weird ones like playing as Link in Mario Brothers or whatever. Um, that, that, that could be kind of quite interesting if they're challenging people on that as well. But I don't know like if that, I don't know, if that would be the point that they're trying to make at that point. I have so no idea. So here's the real question. What? Here's the real question. How far back do you think they had this plan when they pitched like the idea for NES Remix? Hmm. Because Lewis brought up a good point about how it's kind of very similar to that. Right. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know how it's going. Uh, but I, I feel like not necessarily they like had this plan for a long time. Because mm, I, I just feel like I'm not sure if I have enough to, to back this up. Like, just because, I was going to say, because nothing leaked, because we had not heard anything up to this point, it seems like it may have been a decision that they took, like, not that long ago. But at the same time, Nintendo has been able to keep some some stuff under their sleeves for a long time. Like so, Majora's Mask? Yeah, like Majora's Three Mask. Three years. Three hmm. years they kept it under wraps. That's impressive.
Anyway, I think I think we, it's about time that we can move on to a different topic in here. So, Louis, why don't you go ahead and present the topic that you brought us? Okay, thanks, Daniel. All right. No so, um, on my podcast, you should totally check it out. It's called Musing with Menchaca. Um, I just aired episode 18. And in that episode, uh, we talked about a topic here that I would think it's perfect for this podcast. So I'm going to expand the original topic a little bit because I kind of limited it during the uh, initial topic. But the topic is this. If you wanted to adapt a video game, any video game of your choice, any franchise, whatever, would it, and it's got to be a live action. So how, uh, what story would you tell? What, what game would you pick? What's the tone? Who do you get to direct or produce? You know, does it does it air on uh, on cable? Does it air on like broadcast television? Does it uh, does it stream like on Netflix? You know, how do you how do you approach it? What do you do with that property? Um, so, for instance, for me, I mean, I picked uh, Mega Man because I felt like that's a perfect uh, uh, serialized uh, uh, show where every Mega Man game could be a season where at the season finale, you're basically storming uh, Wily's castle and you kind of rinse and repeat every season. You know, each season is a, is a different set of robot masters. Um, for me, I was thinking like a greedy tone, but um, I kind of want to explore this topic a little bit more. Sure, that's great. Well, to me, when you when you talk about like a, a game story that I would really like to see on screen at some point, the the one that comes to mind immediately is first The Last of Us, but that has already been uh, confirmed that they're working on a movie. So I'm I'm actually really excited to see if they'll they'll actually get that done or if it's gonna fall off on development limbo at some point or whatever. But besides that, I'm gonna give an answer that's kind of cliche, which is uh, The Legend of Zelda always comes to mind. And granted, there will be a lot of problems with that because they'll have to figure out what to do with Link. Like, does he speak? He probably should speak because he's gonna be the protagonist of the of the story of the series or the movie. But then, if he does speak, are are people gonna like the personality that they put on him for the series? Or is he gonna be like, excuse me, princess, and like just <laughs> yeah, like they would have to be very careful about everything that they did not to piss off fans. So it's almost to the point where I look at it and I'm like, if it was perfect, I'd love it. But like, probably each person would have a different idea of what's perfect for them, you know? Especially because The Legend of Zelda has like so many different games and different storylines. Like, why would they choose to follow? I feel like they could start with Skyward Sword, which not only is the first in the series, but that I also think has some of the best uh, stories in the series. And honestly, I haven't played all of them. Uh, a lot of them I haven't managed to beat, but I feel like... um I don't know, like, I, I saw myself getting involved into Skyward Sword's story more than most of the other Zelda games. And I, I know today, like, a lot of people bash on Skyward Sword because it was too hand holdy and all that. You probably heard a lot about that as well, Luis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, cause... yes, yes, I'm very familiar. But I, I do back you on that, though. Skyward Sword is a very story, uh, story-driven story game, and and I'd say it's probably the best way. Simply because it gets, it, it's it's a really good Genesis story uh, for, yeah. like, for everyone, for Zelda especially. Yeah, I love the way that it, like, it actually sets up the story. Like I, like, I don't think they were bullshitting when they were going over, like, how, like, oh, this is going to be the first in the series. They weren't just, like, going to make a random story and put it first. Like, they, I actually think there's a meaning for that being first, and the way the game ends kind of sets up what comes after, like... The, the main villain in the game actually has, like, a, a line at the end that pretty much says, like, what will happen in the future. So, plus, like, the the, the story by itself, like, without, without really thinking about the connections to the other games, was already, like, pretty good, in my opinion. There were some moments by the end of that game that I was, like, mind-blown. Really, like when there's there's this one moment where something falls from the sky, and I'm not gonna spoil anymore, but like, yeah, I probably know what I'm talking about. And I don't know, I, I just really liked um, that game for the most part, especially the, the story aspect. So, so let me ask you this um, Is it gonna be a movie series for you or a TV series? Man, I think it would have to be a TV show for The okay. Legend of Zelda because every there's... episode could be like a dungeon or something like that. That's what I was yeah, kind of thinking. Yeah, like too. there's so much because a while ago, like when I I think when I played Ocarina of Time and I finished it, I was like, oh, shit, does it actually have, like, a cool, like, little story? Maybe they, they could make a movie out of this, but wait, like, a bunch of dungeons. Like, how would they fit, like, all the dungeons and all the things that happen, like, going back, like, going back in time and then coming back to the future or whatever? Like, like all the little, well, and I don't remember that much now because it's been, like, a few years since since I played it last time, but, like, just, there's just so much that happens in the game. Like, how can you, like, they would have to cut so much to put in a movie, to put even one game in a movie that I don't think it would be worth it even doing at that point. So I, I feel like a TV show with 
uh I was thinking like one game a season or something, but you you mentioned on your podcast maybe two games a season that could work as well. Because yeah, maybe with like six episodes they could cover it. Um, no, I was honestly I was honestly thinking one 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 game per season. I mean for for me I was thinking like especially like with Ocarina of Time with Ganondorf, I feel like we can have like like subplots put in there that just you can show like Zelda becoming Sheik or you know right give give more motivation give like. Make Ganondorf Man. not a two-dimensional character, but give him like give him a reason. Give him give a little like, a prequel as to how he came up in the in the Gerudo Valley and things like that. I feel like that's I I don't I used to like villains that were just villains for the sake of being a villain, but now I like villains to have more more character depth going on. It's not just menacing, but a good villain for me is a villain that thinks he's the good guy, and I want to see like a, a especially Ocarina of Time. I want to see Ganondorf explored. Right. And like I'm I'm actually fine with them on like adapting the hell all of it, honestly, because I think they would have to to make something really good. Uh like like you were saying, like doing all those like backstories and, and more development into the characters' personalities and everything. Cause, you know, there are some people that are like, oh, the the movie changed the book, it sucks or whatever. But for the most part, I I'm fine that the movie changes the book and I'll be fine if they, they mess with the source material as long as they were making something that's that's keeps the keeps what makes yeah, it keeps the spirit, that's a good way to put it, of the original series while still making something good for the new kind of media that they're, they're using. So for another question is about tone. So do you go like Lord of the Rings or do you go like Game of Thrones or, or something else? Yeah, okay. That's a good question. I mean, for my personal taste, I, I would go Game of Thrones because <laughs> I love that <laughs> series. And like, like, I think I would even like kill link by the end of the first season to justify there being a different link on the other one you know because every game has a different link pretty much so <laughs> right i honestly i was thinking the same thing as like you would have to recast link each season and i think with only like uh, with the exception of like a couple of seasons like one person can be a link for like two or three seasons like for instance majora's mask would have to be the same link from yes ocarina of time um you know like a lot of the nes and the game boy ones are the same link uh, so you can do like Link's Awakening. You can do Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages with the same with the same actor because right. it's all the same person. So I, honestly, yeah. Wind Waker <laughs> and uh, I think I think Phantom Hourglass is the same Link as Wind Waker as well. And there, there's a lot they could do in that. But let's yeah. get, get out of Zelda a little bit. I was gonna say I would also love to see like a really well done Metroid movie. Like just just like this very dark alien like movie, but staring Samus. And I, I, I don't even need it to be based on like the, like everything from the game stories and, and or whatever. Like, and this is the one that I think could be a movie fine. Cause like, I don't, I don't, don't really understand in, in anything from Metroid's lore. I feel like they're always rebooting it. Right. Like, cause I think, I think Prime, I, I I'm not a hundred percent sure of this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Prime trilogy, while they are self-contained, like they, one, one continues the other. So the three together, there are sequels, there are trilogy, but they don't really fit the rest of the story. And then other M kind of negates what Prime did, but like fits the original story or something like that. So I, I don't was, even, go ahead. I was on, I was under the impression that it was all one giant timeline, but okay. Uh, I think I, it I, is though. I may be totally wrong about this. In that case, you like people can totally call me out, but I'm almost sure that when other M came out, that for some reason it didn't fit together with Prime because like there was something that happened in both stories that cut each other kind of thing uh, that made like the other not work. So then I think, I, I don't know that there's like a legit timeline for this, like they released for Zelda, but I think people associate Other M with the previous games, but then Prime is its own thing. I'll have to research more into this, my bad. I, I, I but, I'm, but I'm actually 99% sure of this, but we can look more into it. But I don't know, I just think like a very like dark, scary, um, not a, not a, not an horror movie or something, but just this more kind of like scary action thriller could be pretty cool for, for Metroid. Um, so, so make an alien movie, but with Samus in the role. Yeah, that works pretty much. That, that, that's pretty much what I'm talking about. <laughs> what do you have, Roberto? It, okay. Oh, my bad. Go ahead, Luis. Uh, oh, no, I was going to say basically Metroid would just basically be a mashup between Alien and uh, Boba Fett. <laughs> there you go call it a day ship it yeah i think i think it would be successful shit <laughs> well one problem with that is that samus is kind of a lone character so i mean it's just her by herself a lot through the show and honestly that could get boring unless she has pretty good monologue i don't know well 
they tried to make monologue and other M, and that they didn't really work that well. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. The monologue was cut in, in Metroid Prime, I think. I think they were they did have an an actress voice a monologue at the beginning of Metroid Prime, but that was cut during during production. Damn, I didn't even know about that. But well, what do you have, Roberto? So I mean, kind of going with with my point that I was bringing up because a lot of the, the two games you brought up both had sort of solo characters and person and obviously it really had to be more about the side characters to make those kind of things work so but for me i think i'd have to pick an rpg because time time you know they're they're tested that it's story that really makes an rpg right so i think i'd have to go with a final fantasy i know i I knew i knew when you said rpg that that was gonna be said (laughs) right now what you didn't expect (laughs) and what you're gonna expect I'm not going to say 7, actually, but I think maybe 4. I think 4 would be a good one. Well, it has a, a pretty good story. Person, it's my, I think it might be my personal favorite, honestly. But there, there's definitely a lot of character development in, in that one specifically. And there's just a great cast of different characters as well. Because you've got like Cecil and his sort of personal journey of going from a Dark Knight to a Paladin and atoning for the sins he committed as as a soldier and you know trying to discover the mystery of why his king suddenly decided to go all crazy and stuff and there's there's definitely a lot of twists and turns that people wouldn't expect about certain characters and right so i assume you're going for a tv show with that right yeah there's no way an rpg could fit in a movie most games nowadays with two hours you you've barely cleared the tutorial and started the first level right so, there's, there's so really let, no let way. me let me ask you this. Uh, so Final Fantasy has had two adaptations that were CGI movies. They weren't live action, granted, but there was The Spirit Within and there was Advent Children. So what, right. do you, what did you think of those? I haven't seen The Spirit Within, but I saw Advent Children, and I think my friend put it the best way. It was pretty to watch. But that's about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. It was good for the eyes. That's about it. Okay. I was kind of hoping that I was kind of hoping if you want to say Final Fantasy that I would have liked to if you were going to make a live action Final Fantasy game I think you just have to pick a game with Cloud in it it has to be Cloud because when I think of Final Fantasy all I think is is Cloud Strife and you have to lead with your best foot forward in this case and it's just that's just me though I don't know if you want to counter that point uh I I guess I know a lot of people would would want that the most but I f- I guess there's still some things that'd be kind of difficult to depict as a, with, I guess, like Red 13 and like Cat Kate Seath and stuff. I think there's a lot more believable stuff if we, with 4, although it does have demons and stuff, but whatever. It's, I don't know. I, I personally so, would want to see 4. So give me some more details on this. So how do you, um, uh, what's your tone? What's your, um, what's your direction? How do you, uh, where is it being presented? Is it going to like HBO or is it going to like, uh, like network TV or are you doing streaming? Well, where does this go? Uh, I think Netflix would probably be a good venue for that. Everybody wants to choose Netflix now, right? Because yeah. I guess I was Nef- about to say yeah. I would go for Netflix as well. well Netflix they do, is they too easy. It. It's too easy. It's too easy an answer, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they, they can deliver it right to you in a nice season bundle. You don't have to wait like a weekly kind of thing, right? Yeah. And and besides that, they're just like really good at doing stuff as well. Yeah. Like if they, if they were making the series, like... I yeah I love House of Cards. I just started I started watching Daredevil now. And that's that's been pretty good so far. But I only watched the first two episodes, and I definitely love to see like them tackle some of this stuff. One that I took a note of here is even though like I'm not sure how much I'm into it is Fire Emblem. Um, I only played Fire Emblem Awakening, so I don't even so, know like if I sh- if I should uh fight for this. But it's just like kind of given to Roberto's point. There's like an, an a bunch of characters in there where there'd be enough. To develop like a bunch of subplots and and like different um, yeah. protagonists oh or like different good characters and everything. And you know See, what? Fire Emblem this... would fit. I... Oh, go sorry, go ahead, go for it. I was gonna say that Fire Emblem would totally fit the the whole Game of Thrones thing yep. because because it's one of the few games that does permadeath for side characters. You beat so me to be it. Like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great what I was minds. Say. Great minds. Yeah, no, totally agreed. Like I I actually wrote in here like Fire Emblem. Uh, and then in parentheses, Game of Thrones. <laughs> I was gonna of... say, Go yeah, I was gonna say, you could totally like kill off people. You could have a like a red wedding type thing going on with with Fire Emblem. Oh my god, red wedding! Uh, imagine bring that up. <laughs> ima- imagine, imagine like if you have Marth and he dies like in the middle of the first season or something like that. Yeah, you can do it. You're just done. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> get. I would get on I that Nintendo. Totally... Yes. Let me see. Ghostbusters like movie for Luigi's Mansion. 
What about that? <laughs> you know what? I I will. I played. Uh, I played Luigi's Mansion's Dark Moon, and it has some very clever writing, very good humor. I can see that, except I can't see it as live action. I can see it as a CGI movie, like Pixar esque, but I right. can't see it as live action. Yeah, it's just like I just, Mario, I, right? I just feel like that the 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 that movie is just the the humor is better suited for animation than live action. I can't see. I can't. I can't follow you full heartedly on that one. Right. No, and I, I'm not like being particularly serious about it. I just like kind of came to my mind. And I thought it could be kind of funny. But again, like representing characters like Luigi or Mario or like very cartoony like characters in a live action movie eh, is something that I can't really think of how they would do that right in an entertaining way. Like it's just like why do, why why they would do it? They were gonna make a Sonic movie or something. Like I have no idea. <laughs> but. Yeah, I guess I guess that's kind of it for this topic. Do you want to like? Do uh, you have any closing comments, Louis, or like maybe want more any more questions? No, I actually I like this one. This is pretty good. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I I rest my case. Recently, it's been announced that the new Need for Speed game will be a reboot. They're just going to call it Need for Speed, and it's coming out for P- PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. And first off, I was just wondering, like, what exactly does that mean? Because I thought, like, I thought all those racing games, they had, like, a, a contained, a self-contained story already. Like, I didn't know there was actually a lore for Need for Speed that they were rebooting, or if that just means they're rebooting the mechanics. Hmm. So I, I just thought that was kind of, like, a fun uh, piece of news because of that. To me, it feels like it's more of a marketing play than anything, but... You know, just to get people excited for it again. Oh, it's new again, or whatever. But that made me think, you know, like, there have been some pretty good um, game reboots recently. And the ones that come to mind for me are Tomb Raider and uh, Devil May Cry. Which, I like, I can't I can't really speak about, like, Devil May Cry improving the game mechanics or whatever. Because I have never played a demo, Devil May Cry game before. But I just know that I played the most recent one and I, I thought that was a really good and fun game. I really like playing the game. And then uh, Tomb Raider was awesome as well and that made me think you know why video game franchises what do you guys like to reboot or you know not necessarily restarting the story or maybe just like getting a whole new fresh set of mechanics kind of just like ignoring the what, what has been done before and, and going back to 2.0 you guys uh should i start with this or do you guys have anything oh i'm, I'm ready to go i just i didn't want to interrupt anybody but yeah i can go first but go ahead whoever. all right for me I think with uh, the release of Metal Gear Solid 5 coming out, I feel like Metal Gear Solid is the best candidate for a reboot. I mean, with the whole Kojima uh, nonsense that's going on. Right. um, Even even just forgetting that that's even happening, I think that the the storyline, the 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 franchise as a whole has too much of a uh, of a story that's basically putting up a wall, for, like a barrier to entry for for new for new fans. And I feel like a reboot of just the story from the ground up would be something that's that would be worthwhile for me, anyways. Just because you don't have to basically carry all this baggage of these previous games holding you back creatively, that you can tell a story um, and just start from the ground up. All right, that's a great point. I have to say, I never played a Metal Gear Solid game <laughs> except. For um, the last one that came out, Ground Zeroes. So when Ground Zeroes came out, I, th- I like a little bit after it came out, actually, I think I saw it on sale on PlayStation Network for like $10 or something like that. So I was like, I never played Metal Gear. It's kind of a big franchise. I want to give it a try. So I downloaded it and I tried to play it. And honestly, like I, I gave up. Like the, like the game is only two hours long. Everybody complains about it, right? But I kind of gave up one hour in because <laughs> I just feel like I felt like the game and granted, I'm not like necessarily a big fan of stealth in general, but the the game didn't really do a good job of teaching me the like how to play it and or or just bringing you in and just in general, because like, yeah, there was a there's a game for the PSP. Was it the was it? I forgot the Metal Gear Solid. Peace Walker. The, the Peace, Peace Walker. Yes, I kept I kept thinking of bringing up Wind Waker, which is I know Zelda, but whatever. <laughs> uh, but um no, like there's a at the beginning of the game there's like tapes for you to listen to and there's also a slideshow for you to read to get caught up on the lore and it really does not do a good job because it's so convoluted and so much going on that if you were to try to read it it's hard to follow what's right. going on and that's just 10 slides. <laughs> and I think like as soon as I started Ground Zeroes there was there was also this thing where like you get into the game and then it says like if you don't know the controls 
um, go into the pause menu and select controls or whatever. So I was like, okay, I never played this before, so I want to go and look at like what the controls are or, or anything. So I open the pause menu, I go into the control screen, and there are literally like 20 different pages. Because they just had like the picture of the DualShock, and they were pointing like what each button did, right? So the first screen was like, this is what each button does. So that was fine. And then the second screen was like, when you're crawling, this is what the button does. Or like when you're on water, this is what each button does. And they and they had like that like five times. And then they had a bunch of other slides just like talking about game mechanics and how to do stuff. So they, they had something in there that I could have like dug into and read through. But when I feel like there's all this that I have to catch up to to play a game, I kind of get demotivated to even like keep going with it. But you know, like I read some of it and then I kept going and trying, but it, I just felt like confused at all times about like what, what was my next goal after I did like the first initial things. Um, and I also died a lot <laughs> and I was just like, ah, I don't know what I'm doing here. So I kind of gave up on it after a while. So I do agree. Like it is a franchise that I would kind of like to get into at one point, but I don't really care. Like I don't, I don't have enough time and I don't care enough. To have to play like all those other games and get out, you get used to like all those like different controls and everything. So if they did it like something that started from scratch, kind of introducing you to everything little by little, uh, I'll definitely get into it. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's a franchise that's crumbling under its own weight. So I don't know. It's gonna. I think this. It's very possible that Metal Gear Solid Five may be the last in this particular story. Yeah, I think it's possible. But we'll see. Maybe they'll just hire a different director and it's going to take over and then change it a lot, but continue with the franchise. It's, it has a big name, right? So That'd be blasphemy. What? <laughs> Putting it like you, because of Kojima? <laughs> yeah, you can't have Metal Gear without Kojima. Okay. Well, baby. Couldn't, couldn't you said the same thing that you can't have Halo without, uh, what is it, uh, Bungie? And look at the results. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Touche. But I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll come back on that one. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to that when Halo Five comes out. Then we'll yeah. see how that goes. Hey, you know what? If three if three four three knocks it out of the park with Halo Five, then you know what? Then then my point has been validated. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm right. sure Halo Duty Titanfall Battlefield will be awesome. <laughs> okay. Um. So let me see. I the one I was thinking about. Okay. So one that comes to mind is Sonic. But, like, they tried rebooting it so many times and it never worked. So I feel like maybe they should just give up on it. <laughs> Not to mention Sega's financials are, like, pretty bad right now. So I think, what are they... I think they're focusing on mobile games now. That They wouldn't... Uh, I don't know. They're they're basically... Uh, if anything, I was thinking to myself that Nintendo's pretty much keeping Sonic alive. Because so- Sonic is always on their consoles all the time. So... Yeah, that's right. That's the only time he's ever relevant. I also like uh, you said that they're focusing on mobile gaming now. I just read this piece of news recently saying that Konami is now going to focus on like do more a lot more mobile development as well. I think they haven't even had like this very weird quote from somebody in there was like the future of games is in mobile. So we're going to start focusing more on mobile. And that was a little bit after the whole confusion with Kojima and everything happened. So maybe the next Metal Gear, Lewis, will be rebooted for iPad. <laughs> Holy crap. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> Different director directing a Metal Gear game for, like, the iPad and iPhone or whatever. That will be great. That's, that's just like shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But also- maybe now I can be accessible to you, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With pay to win concepts. Oh my gosh, get out of here, Roberto. <laughs> You're making this. You need worse. more ammo? You need more <laughs> ammo? That's one ninety nine. Or you can wait like a day <laughs> and it comes yeah. back in the next day or something. You can buy five dollars for camouflage for stealth for like invisible and stuff like that. Like the way in the original PS one uh Metal Gear Solid. You got like a Game Shark thing going on. Oh man, you can Game be a, you Shark. Can be, you could be uh invisible. Man, you just got me feeling all nostalgic in here with Game Shark. Like yeah. the, like when when did that like stop being a thing? I think the PS1 era was the last time it happened because there was a cheat code that you can put like a disc in first and then you you boot up your your uh, your get your cheat codes and then you pop in your disc. Right. And then after that, and that was I can't I don't remember right. it going through with any other generation. Right. Yeah. No, I know I think Action right. Replay. Action Replay was still a thing when the DS was out. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> It's basically Game Shark, but they kind of just mess with the hex codes and stuff, so so it kind of tricks the game to thinking you have more of something. Oh, I get it. So, like, it messes directly into the game's memory, just, like, changing variables and shit? Yeah. Oh, man, that's crazy. Um, that's uh, that's 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 what I know about Pokemon, is that people would get their shinies through action replay. Yep. Hmm. Roberto may have some experience with that. 
Some shit all out about it. <laughs> Actually, shinies, I've, I've never really gone after them. It's just like, if it happens, it happens, which is great. But uh, I'm not going to sit there 24-7 waiting for like a 1 in uh, like 700,000 chance. I'm good. Right. I love I, Pokemon, but I don't know if I love it that much. I never caught a shiny, but I, I haven't played that much Pokemon either. I've played a few of the games. Honestly, most I, uh... of them don't even look that cool. <laughs> I uh, I played uh, Pokemon. Was I was Heart Gold, and I was in. Uh, I told the story on my podcast, except I deleted that episode because it was an older episode. Oh, okay. But uh, it was the story where uh, I was playing Heart Gold in co- in my college class before the class was set to start, and then I I ran into a shiny Growlithe. And I was so excited, and I was like, holy crap, I can't fuck this up. And then next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know, the Growlithe uses Roar. Oh, and, no. Uh, the, 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 he fled. I'm like, crap. I got. I was I was not prepared for him either. I didn't have a Pokemon to, to put him to sleep or anything like that. Oh, I didn't God. have. A, I, I was so screwed. I, got I would so have upset. asked my teacher if I, would, if I could be excused. <laughs> yeah, like, just go to your house and start crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I made, I then like like uh, I think it might have been like a couple of months later I just went and hacked me a Growlithe. It was just, it was, it was just terrible. We're having some illegal talk in here. <laughs> this is now a legal game talk. <laughs> so okay, going back to reboots, though, so one uh, a more serious one, I guess. I feel like God of War needs to be rebooted at this point with like a different mythology. I that feel could like be cool. Yeah, like maybe like yeah, definitely a different character. Uh, Kratos? No, hell no. Kratos is too integral. That's like rebooting Mario without Mario. Okay, you have a good point there, but I just feel like that story has gotten so like weird and convoluted as well. And like, I don't know. Honestly, I've only played like the first God of War game for the PS2, but oh, I, okay. I highly, I don't, I'm not, I'm not gonna argue this point on you, but I don't think it's that hard to have a, a what is it, a, a, a mythology or a story that's convoluted with only five games because what there's three god of wars and then there's ascension and then there's one for the psp i believe right it's two two for the psp two for the psp so with six yep. games it's convoluted right well here's the I, thing like yeah. i i like the the basics of god of war in the sense of, like i like the idea of like just being like the super strong guy that can go around killing gods and like just like running around them and like crawling on them like killing them in different Parts and everything, and I know it's just a bunch of like quick time effects or whatever, quick time events. But uh, I still really enjoy that. But I feel like I feel like they need to do something different to get people interested on it again because I feel like the interest has been going down a lot. And I remember like I feel like uh, I think a s- three was shit. I think the I climax. Think th- Three was the climax, and then Ascension was like way down. So like I wonder, and I know like the the one that they were working on after that got. Uh, canceled or already or, or like rebooted or something so i don't know i just been thinking that like i feel like it, it, okay maybe it's not a, a different character but I, I feel like they just need to to tweak that formula around a lot um as far as like the plot and the characters go and everything to make it interesting again and make it unique again but I, I don't have much to add to it like i don't know the solution i i just feel like like it needs a big twist let's see do you think, uh, oh, do you want to move on from this one or do you want to continue on, on God of War? Oh, if you want to add something, that's fine. No, I was going to, I was going to bring up a different game. Go ahead. I was going to say, do you think, uh, Crash Bandicoot needs a reboot? Yes. Man, she, like, I, I need, I want those games back. I definitely do. Um, yeah, and at this point it would have to be a reboot, right? Because I, yeah. I don't fucking remember the story at all, honestly. <laughs> it was different every time. It was... Yeah. Well, see, I was thinking about with Crash Bandicoot. Well, first off, you can't get Naughty Dog to do that again. That's they're 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 past that now. I well, mean, they don't I have the license. That, oh, I thought I thought uh, Sony owned uh, uh, Crash Bandicoot since it was a Naughty Dog. Oh no, I actually wait, don't right. know. I think it's I think actually. Might. You know what? Yeah, you're right. I think Activision owns it actually. I don't know yeah. how that happened, but they do. But yeah, that's why they couldn't get him for like what Battle Royale. Yeah. Oh uh, right, yeah. Be- yeah. All Stars Battle War, whatever. Yes. Uh, PlayStation All Stars. But uh, yeah, with with Crash Bandicoot, I feel like uh, well, first off, ideally for me, I wanted that I wanted uh, I wanted Crash to stay the mascot for Sony because Mario yes. to Nintendo, well, Sonic to Sega, Master I Chief. felt like <laughs> Master Chief to yeah. to to, uh, to Microsoft and Xbox. Yeah, I feel like I genuinely do want Sony to have a mascot, which I don't think they do, and I felt like that one point for the PS One era, it was Crash was unofficially the mascot. And I think for the PS2 era, it was it was Kratos. And I don't 
I can't think of a mascot there even if they even needed or had one for the PS3 era, other than maybe Nathan Drake, maybe, I'd say. Yeah, They have I'd a non-gaming-related one. Which one? The company itself, I forget the character's name, but it's like a little cat. That's their, that's their actual mascot, I'm pretty yeah. sure. But, yeah, but then people probably don't really care about it or know it, like, especially as far as all the game site goes and everything. Um, yeah, so I guess it seems to me like with every console generation, they're just going to switch a mascot up. I mean, honestly, I was kind of hoping Drake would be the mascot going forward, but it may the next Uncharted may be the last. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, maybe it's just not on Sony's strategy to have a mascot at all. Maybe don't, they don't really think that that I don't know. Maybe they don't really think that's going to make any difference. But like the way I see it is that in in Nintendo's history, one thing that they were able to do really well was come up with like this big roster of recognizable characters. That the moment you put them together in a game. Everybody freaks out about it in the moment like you start selling them as toys. Everybody loves them and everything. And I feel like Sony has been around um, it for, for long enough that they could have that as well. Like at this point, Sony should have like a big roster, like interesting uh, mascot like characters and everything that people associate with and like. But I don't I don't feel like they have. Any. Imagine imagine if Sony from the get go owned Spyro the Dragon, Crash Bandicoot and Lara Croft. Yeah. And 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 Solid Snake. Imagine if it belonged to all of them. Right. All those um, all those PS ones exclusives. Imagine if that was Sony IP. Holy crap! Yeah, and then they kept like going well with Kratos and Nate and Drake and everything. They they could they could have built something really good. Yeah. Well, I kind of have to disagree with you, Dan. I think they do have a a good cast of characters that are very recognizable. Okay, which ones? So I mean, they've got uh, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter. Yeah, but those have been like dropped. Like they, they not really. Well, Roger and Clank is in the process Sly of being Cooper. Rebooted. Yeah, Sly Cooper. They've got uh, Twisted Metal. Let's see but the thing crap. is, with with those with those friend with those for uh, with those franchises, they're not like they don't have like necessarily the numbers those those selling numbers to show that they're iconic. I don't think. I think you're right. Yes, they have. That's great IP. But I don't think they're at that point where you can say they're icons and they can stand next to Pac Man. And Mario and Link and everything like that. I think the only other, the only French franchise that either Microsoft or Sony can say that is Master Chief. Right. Yeah. And okay, you know what? I'll give it to Drake, but Drake is too recent. Yeah. Though, I will say. Yeah, honestly, I don't really care about Drake that much as a character. Like, I don't feel like I, I love the Uncharted games, like all of them. I even play the Vita one, but I, I, I don't, I just don't, don't think Drake is that much of an interesting character. Like, I, I don't think. Is that much recognizable? He's just a guy. Like he looks just like a generic action movie guy, and I don't know how much like appreciate that as a mascot. And, and granted, like and the the char- the other characters that you were citing, you know, Sly Cooper and Ratchet and Clank, those are cool. But I I, I just feel like I, I don't know for how long Sony is gonna like keep working on them because okay, uh, is it Ratchet and Clank that you said is, is getting a reboot? Yes. Okay, that one is getting rebooted, but what about the other ones? I feel like the other ones may just like just stop existing, like Crash did. Well, it's because I think Sly Cooper is by not is by Insomnia Games, so oh, okay. and yeah, and Naughty Dog's not working on any Jack and Daxter stuff. They're doing more, you know, like Uncharted and stuff. And I, I find it unlikely that they'll go back to it. Like I, f- I think they would do Uncharted four, and then they will go back to The Last of Us and just keep expanding the universe. And eventually, when PS Five comes out, they'll have something else, you know. So. Yeah, they definitely took a more, I guess, mature route. They kind of left the the cartoons behind, sort of. Yeah, that's true. And at the same time, just to like make it full circle, for full circle here, and go back to the Crash Bandicoot talk. I loved those games as a kid. Like I was like, when I had my PS One, probably the game that I played the most was Crash Bandicoot. Like uh, the the third one, I remember yes. playing a lot. Yes, that's my favorite. And uh, there was also uh, Crash Team Racing. That was the name. Yes. Oh my God! So Mario amazing. Kart. It's Mario Kart for Crash. Yeah, See, pretty I, much. I, I, yeah, right. I. I was gonna say Crash could have been Mario. Really, they could have done the spinoffs. Yeah. Uh, it was an opportunity so, lost. Uh, yeah. The way I was gonna finish that off though is, although like I have those memories, I'm not sure if I would go back and play a game like that way now. Especially when I already you mean have like, Mario. Go you mean ahead. like ukulele? Like ukulele it? Yeah, just... yeah, good point. Like, I saw, like, the, the trailers and stuff for ukulele. I think I think it's great that they're doing that, but I don't really know if I I would play that. You know, like, I feel like I kind of moved past that era, and I want to do, like, I want to play other kinds of games now. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think, like, the regular uh, platformer Crash Bandicoot, not sure if I'll be caring about it at this point, unless... 
they kept like making it bigger and better like they did with Mario. Like okay. they, if they did it what right. If, it, here's what the if thing. I pitch this to you? What if I pitch this to you? Go you ahead. make Crash Bandicoot, but you make it in the style of Mario 64. Like going through the paintings and like uh Well, pa- I'm not necessarily paintings, but like the thing about I I think about I think Mario 64 was the last one really that I would say this about is that there's no 3D platformer where it's like just one giant open world like a hub thing going on. Like I just I feel like with Mario 3D World, Mario Galaxy, they're just basically stages, they're levels. But with I want to I wanted to say a Crash Bandicoot, but with one again, this is not like the the PS1 Crash Bandicoots, but just taking it to the next level where you have just this one giant world where you have to play through it as it's a one giant level kind of sort of speaking. I don't know. This is I'm pulling I'm pulling at straws here. No, no, but I see what you mean. Like, yeah, that could be fun, but I still have to, like, see it and see how they do it. And here's the thing, like, to me, Super Mario Galaxy was great. And, like, to me, they changed the formula enough there where, yeah, it's it's less open, it's more kind of like levels or whatever, but it was still, like, unique enough in its mechanics that I was like, okay, this is a different kind of Mario, bigger, better, unique, and everything looked great, and it had, like, a lot of, like, different mechanics that I, I really wanted to get into it. And, like, I feel like Crash would have to do something like that for me to care about it. And, like, then, actually, Mario 64 did, and then Mario Sunshine did, and Mario Galaxy did. But uh, I'm just saying that, like, they would, they would have to follow that same pattern of, like, innovation at each uh, new iteration, I think. All right, you know what? You you convinced me. I will say maybe, maybe Crash doesn't need a reboot, because, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I guess you can't... I, I guess I was initially asking for Crash as Mario, but I guess maybe that ship has sailed a long time ago. Especially now that I now, now that I now that I forgot about the rights issue that it doesn't even belong to Sony. So and yeah, I think they might get it back. Like I I I, I because I think it's, it's stale. Like they're not doing anything with it right now. So yeah, maybe they could buy it back. And like I I like Crash. I, I I would love to see Crash alive and well again. I'm just not sure if that like specific kind of game they could keep it going well now that it, if it would interest me enough. Unless they made it a lot better, you know, big a lot bigger and better. But you know, the open world one with like being re- like really good looking, really nice levels, some creative mechanics. Yeah, that could work. I'll be not for that. Anyway, guys, uh, this was wait. Uh, this was it. <laughs> I'm kind of attempting to like bring up some new segments in here. I'm going to try like some different things every now and then just, just how those go. But this has been uh, great to have you guys here today. So now that we're getting off, Lewis, why don't you just plug whatever you want and, and just talk about your channel or what you're doing? All right. Well, I host uh, a, a podcast called, called Musing with Menchaca. It's on youtube.com slash Musing with Menchaca. And it's a conversational podcast where I bring my friends to my kitchen table to talk about random topics. And sometimes we talk about games. Um, so, yeah, we just we just basically have fun. We We just... I try to be like a like a comedy podcast, so I think I'm getting uh, pretty better at it. So yeah, fo- follow me on Twitter at chocolaka88, and that's all yeah. I got. It's it's really good, and it alternates between being like very comedic and funny, and then like tackling some very serious topics from time to time, like the vaccine the vaccine stock that lasted like four episodes. That yeah, was good well, because I, I had a yeah the guy his name is Brian, you know, God bless his soul, he was. He was writing like really, really long comments on the thing, and I it had a warrant of video response. I mean, uh, like, l- luckily with my last one, he was he just he left it at one line. He said "good talk" or something like that on his <laughs> on the comments. So thank God it's uh, that topic is over. But I think we we walked away uh, very cordially. Oh yeah, it's been it's been pretty good pretty good so far. I, I follow it. Uh, Roberto, why don't you talk about like what you do and, and where they can find you? Sure, you can find me pretty much on the internet as RJR. 2992. And you can also find me with Dan on the Pseudo Random podcast where we talk about anime. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and if you find that podcast, go and yell at the host of that podcast because he was supposed to be here today and he didn't show up. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks guys. It was great having you today and hope you all have a good day. And thanks for watching Real Game Talk. If you find us on iTunes, please leave us a review. You can uh, find the podcast on Twitter at RGTCast and find on YouTube by looking for the Pseudo Random Entertainment channel uh, or just looking for the podcast name. You can probably find it. So thank you so much and have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Later.